Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We're glad to have you listening today. We're coming to you today via tape, so uh, don't call in. Uh, we're uh, going to be talking today with an old friend of the show, Dr. Doug Welch. Doug, welcome back. <laughs> hey, this is deja vu all over again. Yeah. But, it's, uh, it's good to be here, always. It's good to have you back, and I know the listeners will look forward to hearing from you today. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, you, For those who don't know, Doug passed the baton to me a while back, and uh, I've enjoyed sitting in his uh, a former seat and, and visiting oh, with and gardeners. And yeah, and, and you're doing a great job. You know, it, it's fun. Uh, Tony Snow, when one of those uh, great press secretaries years ago, and I've said it on the air before, he talks about, and Skip, you've done TV, radio, mm-hmm. newspaper, and, and he has done the same, and he talks about, yeah, you can do TV, and you really don't have a relationship with the audience, mm-hmm. and newspaper, you really don't. But radio, you do. Mm-hmm. And, and you've developed the relationship with the group here and the great callers and listeners on, on KAMU, and it, it's just a... A real special opportunity to come back and, and, and visit again. Well, we are definitely glad to have you today, and we're going to be talking about a special project uh, that you've been working on for a little while, and yes. we'll be working on for a little while longer, <laughs> yes, uh, the true. Gardens and Greenway Project. So, yeah. first of all, tell us what that is. What, yeah. what is a Gardens and Greenway? Well, it's a it's the Texas A&M Gardens and Greenway uh, at this point, and, and we, um, you know, it, it's been a dream of this university for years. I mean, some of our colleagues, uh, as you know, Sam Cotner, the late, great Sam Cotner, uh, Gene Ray, who ran this whole Texas A&M uh, outdoor uh, grounds for so many years, uh, Don Wilkerson, our colleague, uh, Joe Novak, our colleague, all had this vision of having a, an outdoor uh, teaching laboratory, if you will, for, for gardening particularly. And so there were some starts and stops when the Bush Library came in. We talked about the Bush Gardens, you know, for in, mm-hmm. in honor of... Uh, the first lady and and that really never got the traction don wilkerson had a great garden for a while and so did Mm -hmm. joe novak but uh, what we found with those gardens um is it's relatively easy to build a garden it's the Uh, long-term maintenance that will kill you and you talk about that every week on the show that that happens a lot with uh master gardener groups and others that the enthusiasm is there to build uh, Mm -hmm. and then you you even as the home gardener where they say oh i think i'm gonna get the rototiller out and rototill about a half acre for a vegetable garden that's, right. That's why we all talk about modular gardening now. Yeah. But, but you know, and A and M is it's funny. You know, if you go back in time, you've been around this university for a long time. You remember the floral test gardens that were right. over behind the former student association. And and as a kid in high school, my brother was here at A and M, and we'd come up for the football games, and and I would go through the gardens, just my interest, my mother's interest in in gardening, and and we would walk through there with thousands of other people, mm-hmm. and. And that was an all-American selection test garden that Gene Ray had developed. But again, it went by the wayside because of the maintenance issue. Mm-hmm. And so we now have, and from day one on this project, we have planned that we, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. Um, you know, Texas A&M wants to be a top ten university in the nation. Um, unfor- you know, there's not one of those that doesn't have a botanic garden mm-hmm. arboretum. You mm-hmm. know, Cornell, UC Davis, University of Florida, University of Kentucky. Uh, you know, all these SEC. Well, you know, yeah. that we have these these colleagues and and uh, universities that we have around us. They have them. So the bad news is we're late to get in the game, but the good news is we're late to get in the game because right. now we can learn from all of them. Right. And and I think that's where we're going. And you've done some traveling around visiting some of these, right? I, I have. You know, I went to Duke Gardens, uh, and I've learned uh, quite a bit. You know, Duke Gardens is at Duke University. Uh, it's it's in the middle of campus, uh, much like this garden will be. We'll talk about location and stuff in a minute, but uh, it, this uh, Duke Gardens is very much a part of the culture of Duke University. Every Mm. student goes through it. Uh, It is very much just like the chapel there, just like Cameron Arena and the basketball, you know, all the, it's the garden is a part of their culture and it's a beloved outdoor space. And I think that's one of the goals we have 
in this project is to create a beloved outdoor space for mm -hmm. current Aggies, former students, and future Aggies, and then for the public to come visit. Uh, but that's number one. The other thing that we I've learned um, in J.C. Ralston's Arboretum in, at NC State, um, it's very much a teaching garden, mm -hmm. you know, for the horticulture classes specifically. So it's got an academic tie. The, the Duke University Gardens, uh, they don't have an academic tie. They don't have a horticulture mm -hmm. department. They don't have an agriculture college. Um, you know, Texas A&M has the largest college of agriculture in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to tie it to those academics, and we're going to go beyond that. We're going to go into the teaching and education, pre-service teachers, so that they can teach kids in a garden setting about STEM and all the science and technology and engineering and math, all those uh, trends that we see. So this is bigger than, this is not just the College of Ag program. This is a university program. I honestly think it is the last key to the puzzle to making Texas A&M in that top 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have done it. We've got our Kyle Field, you know, we've got all our engineering, you know, with a 20 by 20, 25,000 engineers by 2025. Mm -hmm. We've got the Vision 2020, we're, we're on that track. This is what's gonna separate us. Uh, you know, Cornell University, Yale, Harvard, they all have them. Uh, and now Texas A&M mm -hmm. will have it. And it's not a question, we really have transitioned from a dream to reality. Mm -hmm. we, we will build this thing. Uh, we are building this thing. We have money in place. Uh, we're continuing to go after money, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's truly gone from dream to reality. Well, let's back up just a little bit. Give me a little bit of a picture of how this came about, mm -hmm. how the Gardens you, you of Greenway was birthed. Three things that came, uh, came about. One is uh, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, has a complex now. So there's a complex of two buildings were built uh, on Kimbrough Boulevard. Uh, a third building is, was built, fourth building. All that created sort of an area, uh, a backyard if you are, a complex. Uh, there's White Creek that runs through uh, the area, White, the White Creek with the help of Sam Cotner, Gene Ray, year, so many years ago, 1998. Uh, the Board of Regents protected it as a greenway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is the last natural land asset on this campus is White Creek. Uh, and so they wanted to protect it. So that area is assigned to the College of Agriculture. So it's about 45 acres or so when you, when you look at it uh, from an aerial view. Um, so that, that was number one. It created, we had this space uh, assigned to the College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Number two is we have uh, Dr. Mark Hussey, who's the dean and, and vice chancellor of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. He was the interim president for the university mm -hmm. for over a year. Um, and, and his vision has been always of yellow school buses coming to Texas A&M to introduce kids to the natural sciences and, of course, introduce them to Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they really have that starting to grow that next generation of, of college students, of agriculture professionals, landscape professionals, nursery professionals, and do it at an early age. And then I guess the third piece of the puzzle was he hired me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that may be a good or bad. It depends. But <laughs> but I, I retired from uh, AgriLife Extension in 2012 after, you know, 33 years in, in AgriLife Extension. Wonderful career. Uh, enjoyed it so much. So many colleagues like you and others. Um, and as Dr. Hussey said, you know, retirees are cheap. <laughs> and so, so I, I went to work on this project, and I'm, I'm in a part-time role, um, and that is a good thing. I get to play golf every so often, stuff like that. But, you know, and I've, I work really hard to not have a, uh, a, a full-time job at half pay. So, right. I, you know, it is one right. of those things. But that was the weakness with so many of the other projects that we started, um, the Bush Gardens effort, all of these. There was n we all had jobs already, mm -hmm. so it was just another job. Right. Well, this is my job. So 24-7, I think about it. I may not be in the office 24-7, but mm -hmm. it's moving that ball forward. And we've been really successful since 2012. You know, we've engaged uh, faculty, students, and staff in Dreaming. We, we developed a, 
a master plan concept with the students in the College of Architecture, in Landscape Architecture, John mm -hmm. Rodick's class. I was their client. I learned so much about the process, and the kids did a tremendous job of helping us get this on paper in a visual way. And so that was that first big step uh, to get it to where we could really begin to move forward and, and, mm -hmm. and really got some traction. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Now, the garden, I'm, we're sitting here looking at a kind of a map of the overall sector. Tell us a little bit about the different areas of the garden and mm -hmm. how it's planned out. You know, it, the next step we did with, uh, it, we went from a master plan concept with the students, which, you know, they're good, but they're still students, you know, and, and, right. and they're, so we, we engaged the professionals, and we were, are very fortunate. We have a, a lead donor in, in the n name of uh, Tim and Amy Leach, uh, and they are uh, out of Midland. They have, uh, have, fortunately, a very good friend and a very great architect in Mark Wellen and uh, with uh, Rottenberry Wellen in Midland. And uh, we engaged Mark's firm to help us go to the next level of take it from a concept mm -hmm. master plan to a true master plan with great detail, uh, great spaces, uh, and all the things that we need and, and to test it through the process of, of what does the students want, what do the students want and need, what does the faculty need, what does the staff need, and go through. So as we, as you look at it, so first of all, just a little site where this thing's located. So there's, um, for those in your, I'm a visual person, so it's hard to t hold this up to the radio uh, microphone and let you see it, but in your mind's eye, go to Reed Arena. So Reed Arena, right across the street, that's Kimbrough Boulevard, and right across the street is the AgriLife Center, which is the glass two-story building mm -hmm. and the large five-story AgriLife uh, building and complex. So if you put that in your mind's eye, um, then the whole area to the left of the uh, AgriLife building, uh, sort of where the, well, where the White Creek crosses Kimbrough, that is sort of going to be our, our Howdy Plaza. That's going to be the main entrance area. Okay. Uh, we wanted it to be a, have its own identity uh, versus we had originally put it up by the AgriLife Center because so much activity at the AgriLife Center, mm -hmm. but it was getting messed up, too much traffic flow. I mean, you've got 900 students coming in every day to the uh, uh, to the AgriLife complex. You've got another 900 faculty members and staff members. So it was just too much chaos. So we moved it down in that area uh, and created that, that real entranceway. There will be a garden learning center there that will have, you know, uh, room for uh, trainings uh, as well as educational events. It's also a venue that could be very much a wedding venue. I mean, we, kn we know there's going to be weddings at this place, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that we just know it. Um, it's overlooking the creek area, uh, and, then, and then the Rose Garden is, is right in that Howdy Plaza mm -hmm. area. So that's, that's one of the critical things. And, and I'll, I'll step one, one step back just a little bit because we learned this in the, in the student uh, concept, is there's so much going on on West Campus. Uh, West Campus is building, 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 uh, and there's a lot more students there now. You have, right. the, you have the Wainer Building has 2,000 students go into it every day. The Horticulture Building has 900. The Ag Building has 900. There's a physical education, or what we used to call the PE building, across the street on Kimbrough. 2,800 students go in there every mm -hmm. day. Uh, so, and then we have the new West Campus housing project, which has 1,200, 2,000 kids. Right. So what we found is this property and this Gardens and Greenway is very much Central Park. Mm -hmm. It is a hub. It's mm -hmm. a space that gives place for respite uh, in a hectic day. It gives a place to, as an outdoor teaching uh, garden, you mm -hmm. know, and that, I, I really think that's the, the key to this as we described it. It's really not a botanical garden. A botanical garden is a, is a zoo for plants. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a park. Uh, you know, it's not Spence Park. You know, you can see the Spence Park is most parks are overrun. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're worn out grass. You know, stress trees, uh, and that's just yeah. what a 
uh, many parks are, and it's tough not to be that way. So this is a garden, and it, it's very much a teaching garden. And that is what, honestly, will separate us in, if you call it the marketplace. Um, the Dallas Arboretum is, is great. Uh, the Fort Worth Botanic Garden is great. The, mm -hmm. the Mercer Arboretum is great. The, you know, the San Antonio Botanical Center is great. They're not teaching gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a teaching garden, and, and we're, we have that academic connection uh, in a lot of different disciplines, probably over 12, 14, 15 uh, different disciplines uh, of students that will be in this garden every day. Wow. And so our number one clientele is college students. Mm -hmm. Our number two clientele is K through 12 students. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we get to the residents of this campus, which is, you know, 15,000 people or more of faculty, staff, and stu you know, faculty and staff. Then we talk about football day weekend yeah. and tailgating, 100,000 people here. You know, we fully expect 300,000 people to be in this garden every year. That's wonderful. So it, it's really coming along, and I know I'd, I didn't complete the uh, tour of the garden, but anyway, it, it, my mind starts run, ranting on it, well, obviously. Well, you were talking about some of the areas where students can come in, and I notice a lot of the pathways lead out into other areas where students will be going on the way mm -hmm. to the dorm or on the way to the horticulture building or something like that. Uh, what are some of the other areas of the garden, the individual uh, parts that you envision building out that are part of this plan that we're looking at? You know, one of them uh, that's exciting uh, for anybody that's an Aggie, been around Aggie for a long time, is the Grove. Uh, you know, we, we, you say the Grove and people's mind goes to the old concrete yeah. venue and, and yeah. Haydock block, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, a back screen and, mm -hmm. and podium, if you will. Right. Uh, and it's where we watch movies. Yeah. I mean, we all watch the We've Never Been Licked, that yeah. wonderful uh, Robert Mitchum 1932 black and white movie about go. Texas A&M. Uh, and, you know, it, but there's great folklore to the Grove. I mean, it's where mm -hmm. Bear Bryant was introduced. Uh, I had one gentleman tell me, oh, yeah, I saw Bob Hope there. You know, wow. so it was the original outdoor venue. Mm -hmm. For entertainment for Aggies and of course back then there were none but men so you know yeah. but then I've had s several people that say oh I met my wife there so I mean <laughs> in the later days you know when we integrated you know with uh, men and women at A&M uh, you know it was a it was a date place right well we're going to create recreate the Grove and it's going to be down in in uh, I'm pointing to uh, skip mm -hmm. but down in the far end right at the Discovery Drive and Kimbrough there's a natural sloping sort of lawn amphitheater that will okay. that we will recreate and the backdrop will be the creek and there will be a, a stage you know this is not going to be Cynthia Woods Pavilion in the woodlands uh, it'll be a venue for, you know, 500 people or so, but, mm -hmm. but I can guarantee you we're going to show we've It'll never been busy. licked and make some of these new freshmen watch we've never been licked because we had to watch it. <laughs> uh, and there's going to be a parking lot area. Now, the parking lot is more, more gravel. It's more casual. Uh, it's, uh, it's a space that we can uh, bollard off so that we control the parking. But on a, on a Saturday, it may be the farmer's market area. Mm. Um, it may be an area for even a car show or something like that where we can have a little venue there. It will be a special event. You know, not everybody, perhaps not every Aggie, wants to be in the stadium watching the football game with 102,000 mm -hmm. of their favorite friends. So we, we will probably show the A&M game on, in the Grove wow. uh, for a select group of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we do. We have to look at the sustainability th from a financial standpoint. Uh, but it's also with the students' um, housing next to us, it's a place for them to hang out. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be Wi-Fi hotspots in there for the kids just to hang out and wow. be, be cool and be calm. Uh, as we move around, we do have a remnants of the post oak savanna. You know, the post oak savanna is what we are in in College Station, and it's where Texas A and M. It's the ecosystem we're mm -hmm. in. Uh, post oak trees, grasses, yopon, and we have a little remnants of that on this property. And and what we're going to try to do is protect that and and perhaps enhance it. You know, 
as Skip, as you know, it, it, transplanting a, a post oak tree is, is very difficult. Right. It's not even in the industry. Well, I'd love to see a, a research project where we can, maybe we can figure out how to do that mm. uh, and, and really come back with those post oak trees the way we were. And so we're going to try to do it in that area. We'll have wildflowers in that area as well. You've, you've talked about some of the core functions of the garden as we've been visiting, the education and research and demonstration. We, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. But one of the core functions is the sustainable natural habitats. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just going to be a garden where you walk up and look at an herb garden or a vegetable garden or roses, but actually natural areas, which is a whole other area for research and for education. I think so. And, and the White Creek, you know, we've been working on it and, and continue to work on it because it is a very much was very much a degraded stormwater creek which runoff area where ev everybody in in your city wherever you are mm -hmm. we have those all over the place and either we can go in and concrete them so that the water runs right. through or we put gabion walls and all this mm -hmm. ugly stuff. And I, you know, <laughs> I listen, I, I don't, I'm not into ugly. So we're trying to do something really quality here. So what we did is go in and do a natural channel design, as they call it. And we have uh, engineered rock riffles is what they're called. I've learned mm. so much about creek restoration in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, but, you know, this storm water comes blasting through this area and water just continues to dig deeper and deeper and deeper uh, into the ground. And then you mm -hmm. have these steep banks that are treacherous to walk near. So what we've done is really slowed the water. We've captured the water. We've, we've let it go naturally into floodplains where it should mm -hmm. be and then release on out of the area and that has been very successful you know the the rains that were had in in years you know we had drought years and then we have deluge years and mm -hmm. and it goes ebbs and flows but this so far the creek is is behaving itself and and it's it's giving us the platform to then enhance it with plant material and to enhance the flora and fauna in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we put the engineered rock riffles in, and within uh, three weeks, we had fish in there. Hmm. And, you know, little, they're little minnows at this point, but we have snapping turtles, and we have two or three different kinds of turtles. We have about five different kinds of snakes at this point, <laughs> and we have all the poison ivy in the entire county is right here. we got to fix that. <laughs> so, so we're going to be working on this for a while. <laughs> but, you know... One of the things, I don't think we're ever going to have Guadalupe bass in, in the creek, but the real fauna that is here is birds. Mm -hmm. And the uh, real Brazos Audubon here locally does an annual Christmas bird count like all the Audubon societies. And, and there's 50 different species of birds in this creek. Wow. I saw a painted bunting a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You know, it is that kind of environment. We're going to have a bird garden in this, you know, so we it backs up to the creek and we're going to have a, a uh, overlook there where you can sit and enjoy and be calm and listen to the birds. As David Scott, a dear friend and, and colleague and, and great birder, he says, you know, birds are the audio of the garden. Mm. And and they are. And, nice. and to be able to, in a day, slow down long enough to sit and listen, um, in our busy days, particularly on this campus, this campus is a city of its own. Yeah, it, it never is. sleeps. It's right. like New York City. Uh, and to have the students have that opportunity as well as the faculty and staff, that's what we're after. That's pretty cool. That's exciting. Well, you're listening to Garden Success today. I'm your host, Skip Richter, and we're visiting with Dr. Doug Welch. And I just want to remind you that we're coming to you by tape. So don't try to call in today. Our lines are not open, but uh, we're hoping that you're enjoying our discussion about the gardens and the Greenway Project uh, that's being developed over on West Campus. And it, it's really exciting, Doug, uh, seeing all of the different parts that have come together. In fact, it, it's amazing that within a you know, 45-acre space, you can fit in this much stuff. But th that's, a, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a bit scary uh, at, at times. And, and you know, we, we will, uh, particularly in the teaching garden area, which we mm -hmm. focus on that a little bit, but this, when you want to. But it is, uh, it's pretty intense, and, and, yeah. uh, and as is the maintenance. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about the teaching garden and how uh, you envision horticulture and other departments on mm -hmm. campus uh, utilizing that. 
You know, the teaching garden area uh, was our first phase of this whole thing. This obviously will be phased in. Uh, it is the funding, uh, which we'll talk about more, but the funding of this is there's university funding in this, particularly the creek, uh, and getting it underway. Bridges put, it in, put in some rudimentary trails to get students around from the West Campus and through uh, as Mark Hussey says, you know, the, our, our, whose vision this whole thing was, as the dean, he sees this, and as the interim president of, of A&M, he always couched it as this is the connectivity for the West Campus, mm. is to move people through the area because everybody gets in their own little silos and then they get in their car mm -hmm. and drive to the next building mm -hmm. uh, versus having an opportunity to have pedestrian ways, cycling ways, uh, mm -hmm. a, a visual and an enjoying way and perhaps some shade as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but the teaching garden area is three acres. It's sort of the real heart and, and soul of the, of the gardens in Greenway, you know, as we talk about the goals of it of being a teaching garden uh, the, as a whole. Well, this teaching garden complex, and it's called a complex because we have a pavilion within it, uh, a large pavilion. Uh, as well as uh, support, you know, a mechanic, so as, as mechanical area, as well as storage area, as well as restrooms that are associated with that. Uh, and that's the real uh, iconic focal point of perhaps the entire Gardens and Greenway is this pavilion. And Mark uh, Wellen, as the architect, is, uh, is going through that design process and doing a great job. And, and what I've seen so far and where we're going uh, is it's going to be iconic. It's going to be one of those structures that you know mm. on campus where it is whenever you see it. Now surrounding it is going to be an assortment of uh, 14 to 15 uh, gar different kinds of gardens and demonstrations. And so we'll have, for example, we mentioned the bird garden. We'll have that. We'll have a bee and butterfly garden. And, and it's very closely associated with the vegetable garden because our bees and mm -hmm. butterflies, uh, are particularly the bees, are our pollinators. And the butterflies are what I call the mobile art mm -hmm. of the garden. Um, and then we have the Texas Superstar Garden, uh, which, you know, is, is a great educational and research program of Texas A&M AgriLife and Texas A&M Extension uh, and to introduce quality plant material in so many of the plants that we all know today of, of uh, you know, Gold Star Esperanza and, and all the Henry Dolberg salvias and the citrus and the right. everything. You know, I mean, they, these have all been developed through the great work of, of AgriLife Extension and research professionals and scientists. Uh, we have a vineyard within this, um, hmm. you know, because of, uh, you know, one, the, the growth of of the wine grape industry in the state of Texas, you know, the Fredericksburg area is now the second largest grape wine grape tourism area in the country. Wow. The That's second amazing. largest to Napa. Napa wow. Valley and then it's Fredericksburg and then you mm. get to Sonoma or where else in the world in Washington oh, State or amazing. New York or whatever. So it is huge in this state. Um, and then we get into uh, a couple of specific gardens. Uh, we have a, a heritage garden. Uh, we wanted to, you know, Bill Welch and Greg Grant, my colleagues, mm -hmm. or your colleagues as well, Bill Welch and Greg Grant wrote a great book on Southern Heirloom Gardens right. uh, for the South. And it was the influences of the of the different cultures on what how we garden in the South. Mm -hmm. And that ranges from... You know, the Six Flags over Texas, you have the African influence, uh, you have uh, so many of our plants come from China as well mm -hmm. and Africa. Uh, so you have these influences. And so we want to want to do within this two gardens, we're going to showcase the German heritage garden and we're going to have mm -hmm. a Spanish heritage garden two of which, particularly in the state of Texas, have such a huge influence on, right. on the way we garden, uh, the way we look at things architecturally, the way we organize our gardens, and then the plant material within it. And then we'll interpret the rest of the influences. But, you know, in the Spanish garden, we'll have a sort of a, a plaza courtyard area with some water, which would be typical of Spanish. Mm -hmm. We'll have citrus there. We'll have splat, back splat, 
black black Spanish mm -hmm. grape, okay. which is Lenoir, is the wine, and that's the oldest grape that's ever been in the state of Texas. Yeah. You know, as far as production, the quality the original uh, uh, vineyards in the 1600s, uh, uh, the 1600s, back in Del Rio and yeah. places like that. That's right, it's the conquistadores and all the you know monastic efforts. So, mm. you know, we'll showcase that. And it, again, it will be a venue. It's going to be a, a 20 foot by 30 foot uh, plaza that can very much be a wedding venue or a party venue, mm -hmm. uh, a get together. Now, on the other side uh, of it will be the, the German Heritage Garden. As we move uh, from left to right, I guess, if you look in your mind's eye, uh, is a, the German Heritage Garden. And there, you know, we're sort of creating. Uh, Oma's garden, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, there will be a windmill with a cistern, so the movement of water that way. There will be some, a little bit of a row crop type vegetable garden mm -hmm. there, which is typical. Uh, the fencing, you know, the Lano double wire fencing, and and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be in the involved, uh, and then. You start looking at Mustang grapes, you know. So we have the the formal vineyard, which is going to be the the true wine grapes. Mm -hmm. But then in the state of Texas, of the seven species, we have five of them in the state of Texas. So mm -hmm. we are a grape state mm -hmm. uh, naturally, um, and so we will have Champanel and we'll we'll have Mustang grapes in there. Just some kind of trellis arbor, which would be typical to make jellies and jams out of. And then it will bleed over into sort of a fruit orchard, which would again would be typical of a of a German type influence of gardening, of of producing food. Uh, you know, there there's some ornamentals. There's no question in the German garden. There's always ornamentals, but the influence, particular emphasis, particularly is on the the vegetable and fruit. Uh, and then we progress uh, from le left to right. We go into the Earthkind garden. Mm -hmm. Uh, Earthkind Garden is, uh, is these are all naming opportunities, by the way, and, and we have underwriters, if you will, of each one of these gardens, and, and the Earthkind Garden is the Texas Master Gardener Association. Okay. Uh, it's a $100,000 naming opportunity. That's where our naming opportunity started, is at $100,000. And so they, they uh, chose to, to do the Earthkind Garden. They've been such an important part of uh, creating that earth kind and, and as you've told your listeners earth kind is sort of AgriLife extensions trademark term for organic gardening because it right. makes a whole lot more sense there's right. seven principles involved we'll display those seven principles the in earth kind concept is used throughout the gardens in greenway but in this garden we'll showcase exactly and interpret exactly what it is what and principles what those principles are yeah so anyway, and so we continue to move on to the to the right, uh, and that w is where we have. Uh, it's it's not. You see, again, I've learned from other places. Longwood Gardens is in Pennsylvania on the old Dupont property, uh, and they have a great relationship where they produce um, uh, public garden professionals, and and one of their areas that they have in that garden, and this sort of gets into the dirty area of the garden, if you will, is a landscape and a landscape demonstration area mm -hmm. and so what we will do with our classes and in, in design uh, they will design have a design contest and we'll take the top three designs and and then we'll install those the next semester with the construction class okay and then we'll manage it over a year and then we'll do it again okay so that it's a changing event kind of thing so there's always mm -hmm. something new and you know, as anybody that listens to this show understands and tries to hire people, you know, college students are great, but college students usually don't have enough experience. Mm -hmm. They don't have that hands-on experience, and that's what our employers are looking for. Right. So this, in this case specifically, we want those kids to have some hands-on experience and, and know what it is to, if you're going to uh, design something, how do you put it in? And, and that's, that's going to be key to them. So we'll change that out. Uh, and then we get into really the food and fiber garden area, which uh, is fun from an agro agronomic crops right. to showcase those uh, five, six, seven major agronomic crops that we grow. And so that the students that are in Cotton 101 can look, instead of looking at a textbook of what mm -hmm. the stages of cotton look like or look at a, a dried up plant, 
they can actually go out there and see what it means when you say the they're in squares the plant mm -hmm. the the flowers are in squares you know you can look and see it uh, we'll have a, a miniature center pivot in there, and that's mm. that's a great sort of architectural detail. You're going to have envision. students running through there in their bathing suits in the <laughs> summer, I think. <laughs> in a leap <laughs> <Chasing> system. The... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, you know, so we'll have one swath of that spinning around okay. and, like you say, spitting some water around. There you go. Uh, but, it, I, you know, and in and, and all of this, Skip, I think what my our vision is is that students will help run these places mm -hmm. and and whether they're as interns uh, internships or whether they're doing it as student workers uh, in conjunction with the professionals that are really the the where the buck stops on taking care of this stuff but those students can have that ownership in it and the faculty have ownership in these garden spaces right. so the entomology department will be involved and the pathology and they they'll bring their students and undoubtedly there will be de be disease and there will be insects out there mm -hmm. and so they can come out and see and then we've got recreation parks and tourism science kids they're going to do d demonstrations and tours and events and mm -hmm. and uh, f festival planning and event planning and then we have the you know education leadership uh, communication so we'll have communication the photojournalism and all the things that go on there so it's uh it's it's bigger than horticulture it's not a horticulture project it is not an ag project it is a mm -hmm. university project and i think that's the kind of embrace that we've seen so far well that's exciting that this is really going to be as you mentioned earlier one of the things that future students that come through texas a&m they remember this as part of their uh, not only their education but the uh, one of the icons of campus that yeah. they look forward to and, and come back to for years so they'll be saying this is where i got married yeah uh, you know I, I have a you know it's a fun story with my daughter elena i uh, and we had just gotten the website set up for this, which, by the way, the website is gardens.tamu.edu. If you'll go there, you can see much more about this, and, then, and visually you can see mm -hmm. it all. Uh, but it, it, it also, of course, links in. Uh, we had to create a link because we were getting interest. Well, how do I give money to this? You know, I mean, I may not mm -hmm. want to give $100,000, but I want to give some money because I believe in this. Right. Um, and so I uh, got the website together we, we, we with our crew at uh, the AgriLife Center, and it was ready to launch. So I, we launched it just, you know, very slowly, just want to make sure it gets out there. So I sent it to my family uh, just in an email, a family email, and I said, hey, just in case you want to see right. the new website and what Dad's working on, mm -hmm. uh, here you go. And so Elena sent back a question. She says, well, well, how can I give, I want to give $20. How do I do that? <laughs> and I said, darn, we forgot to put the link in for how right. to do that. So right. I put that together real quick and sent it back out there. And, you know, my daughter gave $20. Wow. So, and, <laughs> and the other thing she said, and what's really cool uh, is that I can say that I was here when this started. Yeah. So, you know, over the next few years, we'll start this. And, and then, you know, Duke Gardens, I, you know, visited with their director there. And and he that's where the one where I get that phrase. It's a beloved outdoor space because mm -hmm. he said that every year Duke University solicits their alumni um, in just a mail solicitation to every alumni they have. And you can give to about six areas. Uh, you can give to the chapel. You can get to the Cameron Arena, the athletics. You can give to the garden, the medical mm -hmm. school, things like that. Um, every year he gets $400,000 out mm -hmm. of that one solicitation. Wow. And he's been getting it for year after year after year. And he said, Doug, there's only one reason I get that is because they remember mm -hmm. this garden. It was a part of their life. It was a part of their their campus culture. In fact, they did a survey at Duke Garden, at Duke University, and the number two reason f that people chose to go to Duke University is because of the gardens. Wow. That, number one is academics. One, number two is outdoor environment, mm -hmm. which, which is the garden. And so that's, you know, you know, College Station is not exactly in... in <laughs> 
in uh, North Carolina or South Carolina or some beautiful place. You know, right. we are we are cha- you know topography challenged here. Right. Uh, but we can create some beauty and interest and and move on and and create a, a special place. Well, and it looks like you definitely have, and that that's what that was what we see envisioned, and I'm sure that's what we'll see come into into place as it as it evolves and starts to get built. I want to remind you, you're listening to Garden Success today. I'm your host, Skip Richter, and we're here with Doug Welch, Dr. Doug Welch, who is the uh, head honcho with the design. <laughs> is that the official title on yeah, paper? Yes, yes. The, on it, that's the new title I just put gar- on it. But, <laughs> the no. Gardens and Greenway Project at Texas A&M. Well, Doug, tell us a little bit about the agricultural heritage. That's one of the core functions that we haven't mm-hmm. talked about. Yeah, y- you know, we want people to, when they go through this, um, to to ha to subliminally subliminally and perhaps not as overtly know that they've been in an agricultural experience an experience with n- nature um, and the natural environment you know we talk about SS- SEC and you know LSU uh, a couple of years ago they, they very early on the SS- SEC they brought thirty thousand fans here. Hmm. Well, only 8,000 of them went to the game. The rest of them are here just for the experience. Wow. So, you know, we've seen at the Bush Library, they've had a 25% increase in the fall mm-hmm. of, of attendance because of these, the way the SEC comes and tailgates and enjoys. Right. So we're going to have that opportunity here with true visitors that are mm-hmm. not ag students or aggies or or whatever they're gonna they're gonna come in here and and see this and so we want to showcase not so much a history you know i I think we we too often with agriculture we talk about history Mm -hmm. uh what i think is more important is what is agriculture in the future and and i think that's where we will try to showcase you know this and connect people where does your food come from if you've got a food and fiber garden and you've got a vegetable garden and you've got mm-hmm. a pecan orchard and a fruit or, fruit orchard that's it yeah. <laughs> and yeah. now we we may have a chicken coop we're think, thinking about a chicken coop but you know i'm not we may have guineas i'm not sure oh, but boy. but i'm no i know we're not going to do sheep or goats or cattle <laughs> you know I, but but we can get there where we can start saying, where does your food come from? Mm-hmm. Here's a connection to agriculture today and in the future. And then, of course, the natural environment is very much much a part of what we do in agriculture uh, and take care of it. Uh, you know, I think we're the spray and pray days are mm-hmm. gone. Uh, right. And thanks to all your work right. through the years, too, it's gone. It's it's going by the wayside. Um, this garden will be managed. It's going to be intense enough that we're going to have to be careful. We're going to have to use pesticides, but we're going to use organic pesticides mm-hmm. uh, by and large. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll go to a, a chemical if we need to. But I, I just don't see that happening very often. Yeah, you were talking about the food production, and it's amazing how much interest has increased in food production in recent years. Uh, I, you know, there was the victory gardens of World War II, mm-hmm. and then there, I remember a time during the 70s when everybody was getting into gardening, and then it sort of just disappeared. And mm-hmm. now uh, we get so many calls at the office with people interested in producing their own food or mm-hmm. people that want to learn how to garden, but they don't, their mom and dad didn't raise them in a garden. Yeah, and and that's a good point. I mean, I I, I say it in in my book, tell the story about my mother. You know, I, I came home with the from vacational Bible school with the Dixie club, Dixie cup, and the proverbial bean seed. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and and so I said, what do we do? And fortunately, she was a gardener. Her father was a gardener, mm-hmm. and uh, and so we planted, and I grew those bean that bean plant. I had eight beans, and my mother <laughs> loving cooked those beans we had five people in the, in the family <laughs> everybody got by, everybody got 1.3 beans you know so I fed the family and I remember that and and to put it in the book I had to fact verify that you know was I making up something or not and right. I went to mom and asked her and and she said that's right that's what happened and I said well my question is how old was I mm-hmm. and she said well you know that would have been St. Martin's you went to so you were five hmm. So at age five, I known, known I'd done something good. Yeah. And so I, I think we are getting this renaissance of, of food and in, uh, interest in food production. Right. Um, there was a lost generation of, as 
that our colleague Charlie Hall talks about of that age 35 to 45 that just that we in the marketplace and he's a market researcher for horticultural products mm -hmm. and it was gone they weren't there and now the 25 to 35 generation they're in it mm -hmm. and so seed sales from all the big vegetable seed companies uh, have have soared you know locally mm -hmm. producers co-ops seed sales have like doubled uh, and their fruit sale in the in the fall just is astronomical compared mm. to what it was so we have that interest and i think that's why in this gardens and greenway um there's such an emphasis i mean virtually every garden whether it's the spanish garden heritage garden or the german heritage garden uh, you know or even the texas superstar is going to have vegetables right. and fruit in it i mean that's right that's the edible landscape that you know right. I mean gosh we went through that in the 80s mm -hmm. and now here sure enough here it comes back uh, again and and we're gonna have a great place to teach people yeah that's pretty cool I I'm excited about the the part with Earthkind Gardens and Texas Superstars and I noticed you even have a, a rain garden over there you know it you've been educating people about water conservation for a long time <laughs> yeah. I know back in San Antonio and whatnot you were doing that and it's it's hard to get people interested in water conservation when it's pouring outside yes. for days on end. That's right. But we know drought will be here. It's part of the the uh, future of Texas. And uh, we with the growth we're seeing, and we, we're headed toward this uh, point where we can't supply the water to the people mm -hmm. that we have if mm -hmm. we don't find ways of, of uh, either producing new water or conserving the water we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an exciting uh, element of it, uh, the, the idea of xeriscaping and water conservation mm -hmm. uh, with, with pond gardens and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, you remember those days of, of oh, yeah. xeriscaping. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and I think what we're taking the lead from our, uh, our agri-life building complex. You know, we do have a rainwater harvesting yes. system. Uh, we harvest about 80,000 gallons of, of water uh, is the storage capacity. Uh, we do use it for our landscaping around. We will blend it as we need to uh, through the summer mm -hmm. uh, to extend the water and increase the quality of the water with rainwater. Uh, throughout the Gardens and Greenway, we'll have rainwater uh, rainwater harvesting setups. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not going to water the whole thing with rainwater. It's right. n it's pretty darn impossible uh, at this scale. Uh, but yeah, you know where we are today, uh, Skip. It, water's a critical issue. I mean, Mark Twain's one that said, "Whiskey's for drinking and right. water's for fighting." <laughs> and and this state is, is uh, got some major water. Uh, projects, you know, in the plans, and, and it's the old NIMBY process, not in my backyard. Right. No one wants that 30,000-acre reservoir on top of their homestead right? Uh, and be paid just the going rate for, for land. Uh, so it is an issue. It's a monstrous issue, and I think that's what's exciting about gardening is that we can instill that uh, into people right at their home mm -hmm. uh, I mean, because they pay their water bill. Uh, they know we don't have to. We've seen it ebb and flow. You know, we have people in El Paso going to AstroTurf. You know, we have, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's gone it, as usual. Things swing back and forth. It's called normative change, and, and uh, that's just the way it goes. But it, it takes a long time. Well, <laughs> it's been, been working on it a long time. The way we live in landscape is definitely going to be different in mm -hmm. decades to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, the days of just wasting water because it's there and cheap, yeah. uh, at some point that we run out of that and we, we, we have to change the way we live. Yeah, I think so. It's been interesting over the years and most of the water utilities are now changing where it's a reverse rate water structure where the more you use, the more you pay mm -hmm. per unit. Uh, that was not the way it was, you know, 10 years ago. It was basically the more you use, the less you got. So, I mean, right. I, I can understand that for diapers at Walmart, but I do not understand what that for a, uh, a limited natural resource. Water right. is not an unlimited natural resource. Uh, it is a very limited natural resource. I think, honestly, uh, my prediction is the state of Texas, we're doing fine economically and we continue to grow, mm -hmm. but at some point in time, somebody's gonna say, wait a minute, how many people in the Houston area mm -hmm. can you put, you got six million in the Houston area right now, can you mm -hmm. put seven? Yeah. Can you put eight? 
Right. Because that's the way it's going. Yeah. It, it's uh, mind-boggling yes. seeing the change yes. and the progress that's gone on. Well, people that are interested in the Garden Project, uh, you mentioned they can go to gardens.tamu.edu and see photos and, and uh, diagrams of everything and learn a lot more about the gardens. But there's also the opportunity to give, and I'd like you to talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, how people give and yeah. some of the, the different uh, areas that are still open sure. for sponsorship. Sure. You know, we, we have everything from uh, friends of the garden. You know, if you give a dollar, if you give up to, I think it's uh, $25,000, you're a friend of the garden. And, you know, in the friend of the garden, we'll, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're quite going to get to a certificate suitable for framing. Mm. <laughs> but, but I, you know, it's one of those that, that we want you to be a part of it. And, and, and right. some of this is still developing because we want to see if you're a friend of the garden, there's benefits to it. And certainly I've been a, you know, friend of the San Antonio Botanical Center for years when I was there. And there were great benefits to doing it, access and things like that and we'll, we'll develop that over time we have another level called the garden benefactors uh, garden benefactors are basically twenty five thousand dollars to a, a hundred uh, ninety nine nine ninety nine mm -hmm. uh, thousand dollars um, and those will actually we will put their names on we have a a, a wall a donor wall that mm -hmm. is being designed into this project uh, and we'll put people's names etched there in a, in a wonderful garden setting uh, where they can see it. We're not going to do bricks. I mean, I can, I can tell you right now, we're not doing bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, bricks is one of those things that a lot of groups go to. Uh, it raises a little bit of money. It also sort of looks like graffiti on the ground sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure aesthetically I want to do it, nor the effort that it takes to get a few bucks here and there. Right. Um, so we have the, the garden benefactors. And by the way, I have learned so much about development Thank goodness for Texas A&M Foundation and all the colleagues. They they handle most of this, so I get to mm -hmm. stay on the garden side and not get into the money side of it as much. Mm -hmm. But then we get into the the naming opportunities, and those are at a hundred thousand and and up. And right now, for example, uh, the Spanish Heritage Garden uh, is at a hundred thousand dollars, and we have that. We have the Herb Garden, which I'm real surprised the Herb Garden's still around uh, mm -hmm. to be selected. Uh, but it's a hundred thousand dollars, and the rain garden is a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and then we jump up into higher things. We have a upstream bridge that's five hundred thousand. We have an uh, event, a pavilion. Uh, the pavilion is a four million dollar uh, under you know naming opportunity, as mm -hmm. they say. Uh, but then we have a, a creek overlook that's six hundred thousand, and and you know these are big dollars, uh, folks. I mean, believe me. I have sticker shock every time I look at how much things cost and how much, w with a straight face, you ask somebody for. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, again, I go back to uh, some of the gardens that I visited and their message. This is about an investment in Texas A&M University and its future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, $100,000 is not going to build, you know, a... a uh, you know, the herb garden in the sense of what we're building, you know, not, it's just the infrastructure. It's always the plants. The plants right. cost nothing. I mean, the plants on this whole thing is less than 10% the whole construction, but right. we've got to put sidewalks in and, and irrigation. utilities, mm -hmm. irrigation, and all those things. Um, so it's really, as these gifts come in, regardless of whether it's a, a $25 gift or a $4 million gift, mm -hmm. these are an investment in Texas A&M, and it's an investment in our students here and in the future of our, our, our future students that we have. Um, it, it is, um, I've had too many uh, donors that have literally almost gone to tears with the opportunity mm -hmm. they have of making such an investment on a unique once in a lifetime opportunity right. here to get something going. I mean, it's, we we've, we've done real successful with Kyle Field. Mm -hmm. And you there's a tit for tat there. You know, I mean, you do this, you right. get a you get X, uh, you get a suite, or you get chairs or seats or whatever. Right. This is more of a passionate in investment in the future of what A&M looks like beautif beauty uh, beauty. It's a beautification project. We're setting a standard for what this campus should look like mm -hmm. uh, and will look like in the future. 
uh, and it's investment in our students and their quality of life. I mean, oh. you know, the quality of life in, on the main campus, it's downtown. Mm-hmm. You're not going to change the quality of life there very right. much from a green standpoint. Right. But on West Campus, we have that opportunity. It is that moment, uh, a flash of genius that we can actually do this and, and do it well. That's exciting. You know, I'm excited to see it, to hear about it. I can't wait to see it happen and be part of it as it, as it moves along. Uh, Doug, I so much appreciate you coming and visiting with us today. For those of you who uh, have just joined in late, we're visiting with Dr. Doug Welch uh, and the Gardens and Greenway Project. He's project coordinator. And for those of you who would like more information, go to gardens.tamu.edu. And thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.